And I've been graciously asked and invited to come and speak to you. I'll, I'll speak from my perspective. It's nice to see a lot of the familiar faces out there. Uh, and uh, I'm just honored that you come to me for a dentist. You know who you are. <coughs> and uh, if I say something I've already said to you, just try not to get too bored and I'll just talk to like I'm talking to everybody else. Uh, I, uh, I come all the way from Fort Worth, but I just follow this river and then a lot of freeways and end up over here. Uh, I'm, as far as what I am and what I do, I've, uh, I'm a dentist, I'm a naturopathic physician, I'm certified. I don't practice it. You know, there's not a license for it in Texas. I just use it mostly so that I can get some perspective so that I can help the people that need that kind of help or help steer them to other people that can help them. Um, uh, licensed massage therapist that came from my activities uh, working with TMJ and structure had a lot of training at the uh, uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine there in Fort Worth and craniosacral work and structural things and I've learned to appreciate so much the integral association of structure and everything in our body whether it's physiological or TMJ especially in my case and uh, so to kind of get through the gray area of assessing structural things, I went ahead and got a massage license so that I could legally do this. Um, Academy of General Dentistry, the uh, Academy of Craniofacial Pain, which has to do a lot with, with uh, TMJ problems, head and neck and facial pain and sleep disorders. And then Academy of Pain Management. Uh, I've been working, I've uh, been practicing actually about 33 years. Uh, and the reason they still call it practice is because I still haven't got it right. So I don't have all the answers, and I'll, be, I'll say that in a New York minute. A, a New York minute is approximately point zero 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 five seconds. It's the amount of time it takes the cab behind you to start honking when the light turns green. So that's how fast that I'll admit that I don't know everything. I don't know all the answers, but I will tell you all the answers that I do know, and I'll help steer you toward people that can help some answers if I don't know them. Okay, the tooth chart. I looked over there at something like 12 bucks. Did it used to be 35? It was worth it. When I bought it at 35, I'd do it again in, in a minute. Uh, it is the best. I've seen a lot of charts, all the way from Korean charts, Chinese charts, combination charts, uh, biological dentistry charts that have to do with the tooth, the teeth and their correlation to the other thing in the body. Uh, without doubt, I can easily say this is the most comprehensive and the best chart that I've ever seen. In fact, I talked Dr. King into making a tablet so that I said, I will buy it. I will buy it. Just make a tablet so that I can have that on paper so when my patients come in, I can tear it off and give it to them uh, and highlight the teeth that are problems with them. And he was gracious enough to do that. Give them to your clients. Give them to your family. Look at them over and over yourself. Okay. Uh, the other, what this slide is about is to is to uh, encourage you to look at not just the tooth, but look at the teeth on either side of the one you're thinking about as far as correlations are concerned. Because everybody's not the same. You can look around the room. We all have eyes, ears, and noses, but we look different. And our internal anatomy is different, and our energetic anatomy can be different. It's going to be close. I mean, most of our noses are right here in the middle. Okay? Uh, I won't go there. Anyway. <laughs> But anyway, uh, they're, they're in the same, same general place, but there can be some nuances that would make you want to go one side or the other. Okay, consider the spaces, like if a, if a tooth had been extracted. Uh, consider the missing teeth, either congenital or if it was extracted for some traumatic reason or for uh, uh, decay. And the supernumerary teeth, where you have an extra tooth growing right between two teeth are supposed to be there, it's an extra tooth. So if that's the one you're looking at, then you need to check the teeth on either side. Okay, wisdom teeth. The acupuncture meridians or energy or spheres or uh, pathways, okay, they can warp. And all the things on your chart can be affected by the third molars. It's like all bets are on, all bets are off. That, the third molars, in fact, that might even be, yeah, that's the next one. Uh, because the acupuncture or the, the uh, pathways can warp. And by that, I mean, look at these fingers, like they're all going in the same direction. But if I twist them like this, then they're all right together. In fact, they may be even go through the same point. Or they may be in the same 
level, or same area, but a different level, one superficial and one deep. So that's what can, can happen with all the pathways as they pass through the third molar or the wisdom tooth area. So that's kind of the, the wild card of the teeth. Um, what can cause the tooth to affect other parts of the body? Yes, sir. Uh, just a question about the wisdom teeth in general. I mean, it seems like it's kind of a, just a foregone conclusion. We just pull them out when you get to a certain age. Are we... I'm guessing that we're not supposed to have extra teeth. God put them there for a reason. So, what do you think? Because of lack of space, instead of the teeth coming in in line, they're coming in out, outside, or the back teeth are coming in forward, or they're impacted, because there's just not enough room. And when you think about what we are in the United States, of all places, we're a melting pot, a literal melting pot, a genetic melting pot. So if you've got a 6'4 Swede that marries a 5'2 Italian lady, and they get his teeth and her jaws, you just don't have enough room. Okay? So sometimes that just happens. It can also be affected by diet long term. And by that, you know, the sugary diet, the oh, Western Price's studies. Okay? The things that can affect other parts of the body are tooth decay, traumatic bite, which means the teeth do not fit, they rather they bang each other, uh, infection, abscess, gum disease, metals, and diseased bone around the tooth which can come from a variety of reasons. Okay, these are just things that can affect other parts of the body. How would the tooth affect something else along that same pathway? And the other thing is that pathway can also affect the tooth. Now, I will say here that I don't believe that any tooth actually causes necessarily a decay, I mean a, a disease. It can, but I don't think it necessarily always does. It can usually be, in my opinion, a contributor in that it interrupts the pathway. That pathway is made for energy to flow. And if it can't flow, it either impedes that pathway or it opens up and it flows too fast. Either way, it can affect. But, that's, uh, but the reason the teeth are important is if this doesn't get resolved, it's like having a barrier in the road. If that barrier is still there, the flow is interrupted. If the barrier is removed, then the stuff the other health pr uh, practitioners do starts working. It's not what I do. I'm just getting the impediments out of the way when I like, fix the tooth. Amalgam fillings. Uh, you may have heard about uh, amalgam fillings being good or bad. Uh, let me tell you the good thing before we get too much. I've had patients come in and say, how could that dentist have put in fillings in my mouth that have mercury and he knows mercury is a poison? Well, let me tell you, I don't believe any dentist has ever woken up in the morning and said, I think I'm going to stick this fill in there so that lady will have a hard life or to poison her. He's doing what he was taught was the best thing, and he's doing it his way. And in his defense, the American Dental Association and many other organizations are coming down and using the research that shows that it is safe. As we all know, especially Andrew and, and uh academic world. We can make um, experiments show what we want them to end up showing by the way we collect the data and by the way we interpret the data. That includes even how you listen to me. So put a little filter on when you listen to me too. Does it make sense or not make sense? Okay. Ultimately, it's your responsibility. I'm telling you the way I see it, you filter it through your system. If you like it, use it. If you don't, shuck it and go do something else. But uh, we all ultimately have the responsibility to decide what we use and what we don't use. And that's the way we have to look at a dentist that has put these in. Not an ill-meaning dentist, just doing what he's taught. Now, the facts. Amalgam fillings are about 50% mercury and 50% metal filings. These are just literally filings of different metals. And the metals are consist of copper, tin, silver, and zinc. They all have their different reasons. Some are for uh, uh, lack of expansion, to keep the expansion and contraction uh, limited. Some are to keep it from corroding quite as much. Some are to keep it, uh, make it a little bit stronger. But they are, there's reasons for them being there. Now, this is just an uh, image of a neural transmission and it's to illustrate the fact that mercury is indeed a neurotoxin. Does it kill us? Not, in, not enough in a mercury filling to kill us, but it's enough to be an immune suppressant. 
each time we eat, uh, if we chew something, it doesn't have to be food. We could chew paraffin, which is wax. Okay, we could chew something. Anytime you have something hot in your mouth, anytime you have something that has acid, like lemon, uh, like um, jalapenos, and if you're from outside of Texas, Mexican food is a staple here. Okay, uh, anytime you have something acid, hot, or uh, chewing motion, it volatilizes the liquid, of the, rather the mercury that's in the fillings, and it's up, you inhale it, gets in your lungs, and gets in your body. Now, it doesn't kill us, obviously, but it's still an immune suppressant. So that's, uh, uh, that's just, it's, it's a brick we can unload. There's, when we try to get well, there's some things we can get rid of and some things we can't. Okay? I had knee surgery, I've got a titanium screw in one of my knees. Okay? The reason that the, that the physicians don't take them out anymore is because the bone literally grows all around that screw and they realized the process of going there and removing the screw is more invasive than leaving it alone. Now what if I can't handle titanium? Well, it's too late. Things stuck in there. And how would I know? Well, right now what I would do is find somebody to help me make a homeopathic remedy to neutralize that. Because there's some things I'm never, I can't ever, I can't ever, even if I got the screw out, I can't ever make my knee be as if it had never been injured. The injury came and I've rehabilitated, but I'll never be as if it hadn't happened. So that's something I cannot uh, unload. I can unload the mercury in my mouth. So it's like the things that add up in our lives are like uh, a backpack full of bricks. If you want to get well, you get rid of the things you can get rid of, and you get strong enough to carry the things you cannot. Just my opinion. I'll try not to get too wound up on this stuff. Okay, here's where the mercury goes in the body. This is a, sorry if you're a PETA person, but animals can teach us so much. This poor sheep was going to die anyway. Okay, but what they did is they put some amalgam fillings in this sheep. Had him live his life for 60 days, and then... The poor fellow died. I don't know how. But anyway, they laid him on a photographic plate and just let him lay there for a while. And it, the uh, mercury fillings were tagged with radioactive elements. So wherever that uh, mercury went, it was the mercury that was tagged, wherever that went exposed part of that plate. So it let us know where it went in his body. And you see the dark areas. It's a, it's a reverse x-ray. The dark areas are the areas where it went. A lot in the gut, liver, kidneys, jaw. It also can work up into the brain, except there just wasn't enough in 60 days to show it. Okay, mercury can get into the fetus, and it can get into breast milk. There's a, but this is just the research part of it. There's a high prevalence of mercury in fetal compartments, and they indicate there's a fetal transfer, and there's fetal trapping. If you're a mom, you're eating a lot of jalapenos and you got a little baby in there, a baby's going to get some of it. Not the jalapenos, they get the mercury. Uh, the mercury concentration in mother's blood underestimates the degree and extent of fetal exposure. So if you take the mom and, and see if there's mercury in the blood, it won't show up near as much as if you get some tissues from the uh, fetus. Now, the reason for this is the mercury is not in the blood long. It goes to the cells. It's like being in space and, and looking at the United States at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. Say, there's not that many cars. It's because they're all in the garage. If you got out during uh, rush hour, you'd see a lot of cars. Well, that's the way the mercury is. It goes into the cells and it stays there. It doesn't circulate much. So to get an accurate reading of how much mercury you have in your system, the best idea is to do a challenge test where you use something like DMPS or some other drawing uh, chemical which draws it out of the cells. And then you do a, a urine test and see how much is excreted. So uh, it'll, it'll rarely show up high in the blood. You'll see it sometimes in the hair, but the best way is a, is a challenge test. Uh, increased mercury excretion in breast milk and urine correlates with the number of fillings. So that does, these are just indications that the fetus is getting affected in relation to how many fillings that the mom has. Okay, mercury-related gene. Why is it that there's some people that die? You know, they die of mercury poisoning when they're 112 years old. You know, there's some people like that. 
they, they're a hundred years old, got a mouthful of fillings, drink a little bit every day, smoke. And then you get some people that are 38 years old and they're getting Parkinson's disease. Why are some people more susceptible than others? And it has to do with some genes. Some people are good excretors, some people are not. There are genes that uh, have been isolated that are associated with ability to excrete heavy metals. It seems to be a little more prevalent in the Scandinavian populations. The problem is the, the people that do not have the genes. It's a recessive trait and there seems to be more of them that are Scandinavians. So uh, it just means that there is a gene. So what do you do with that information? I mean, what if you're Scandinavian? You go roll up and die? No, you just deal with that. But the, the point of that is finding the fact that there is a gene that relates to that and it helps answer the question why does it affect some of us more than others. If we can excrete more we get it excreted. If we can't it piles up and then it affects us more. Okay, galvanic response. That's where you have dissimilar metals. What you see there, that's a battery. Okay, in the car the battery is sulfuric acid which is an electrolyte. You have dissimilar metals, two different kinds, copper and zinc. Um, and what happens is when you have dissimilar metals in an electrolyte, it causes an ion flow. The ions literally go from here and up and around. It makes a circle, but you don't have as many left over because it lights up that light bulb per first. Okay, in our bodies, uh, the electrolyte would be our saliva. The dissimilar metals would be a gold crown and an amalgam filling or an amalgam filling done this year, another one done the next year, and it's a different brand and has slightly different percentages of components. Now what can happen at that? At best, nothing. At worst, maybe you can pick up a radio station. I mean, it's happened, it's, but that has to do more with frequencies. But what it does do is cause a transfer of ions. Now it's not like an ion exchange, it's not like me going across the room. It's like you being hand to hand with you and you and you and somebody bumps this hand and the impulse goes to the other end. It's kind of an ion exchange. Bump, 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 bump. And the ion goes from that end. But all they've really done is just kind of transfer to the next orbit. Okay, so I know you're interested in all that stuff. The problem with the galvanic response is it just increases the opportunity or the uh, proclivity toward uh, an amalgam releasing some of the ions, especially in the, especially in mercury. Okay, this is a picture. This, that's where a crown was taken off and that's an amalgam filling that was underneath the crown. Okay. There's the crown, there's the filling underneath it. Now there what you have is a metal coping which has a gold content which might be high, it might be low. But it might have mostly base metals, it might have mostly precious metals. Either way it's always an alloy. Gold all by itself is too soft to use as a crown. So the hardeners in the crown can be a problem. The, uh, the base metals, you might have beryllium which is used industrially to make the blades for turbines and jet engines. It's good hard metal and it's light and it bonds to the porcelain very well. Problem is it's very toxic. If you're a lab man you have to deal with them. You have to wear kind of a gas mask. Uh, so it's not good if it's in your body either. Uh, the uh, other ones, there's a combination of uh, copper and cadmium, if they're together, they can be very sensitizing, much the same as if it has nickel in it, which is also used as a hardener. Now nickel can be, uh, that's what's used in, in uh, metal to uh, make it shiny, make chrome, make stainless steel, uh, stainless. Uh, it, it's, sometimes it's in the cheap jewelry, some people it can't wear rings because it turns their finger black and, just, and, and some people are like that in their gums. It can actually irritate them just because of the metal. Uh, <clears throat> but if you have one metal sitting on top of a metal, another metal, then you have an instant galvanic response, as if I was uh, explaining the other day, a while ago. And if right here, you can actually go through the tubules and get those ions streaming down through here, then get in the nervous system, and it's a pretty short trip from the teeth up to the brain. Can't happen. Stortemeyer, Stortebecker, who is a neurologist out of Sweden, did some studies showing the heavy metal going from uh, mercury actually to the brain. Okay, another example. This is a gold crown 
an amalgam filling, an amalgam filling. There's the gold crown and the first amalgam filling there. Now, there's another thing. These two are touching each other. It's an instant galvanic response. This is a uh, porcelain veneer crown, so it has a different kind of metal here than this gold crown. This gold crown chews and hits against this tooth and this tooth, so you get the galvanic response going there too. So this, every time this person chews, man, we got electrons scooting out, ions rather. Okay, next one, another example. Two crowns of different metals next to each other and against each other is what I was just showing. Uh, different metals in the same mouth, what I was just showing, just another example of it. And an amalgam under a composite. Oh, the hardest, the hard, the worst, worst situation is a lady comes in, she's had her amalgams out, and then we take some x-rays, and she says, what are these little white spots underneath that filling? This is what the composite looks like, and that's what amalgam looks like that's under the composite. This is what two little amalgams look like underneath that composite. Now, she says, I told him to take them out. And I said, well, let, let me just get on his side for a minute. What he probably heard from you is, I want white fillings. I want white teeth. So he got the top of it out and put composite on there. And now she's got white teeth. What she wanted was the mercury out. This lady was not furious. She was livid with a capital L. It, but it's okay now. Everything's okay. <laughs> this is just a picture of me. T I took out some of the composite and at the bottom... You can see the little pieces of amalgam in there. And they're right next to the tubules that go to the pulp that can get into the bloodstream. So it still, can, it still happens because you get a constant flow in there. Um, is it, I mean, is that a problem? Yeah, but it's fixable. Okay? When your problems are like, I, I tell people so many times, your problems are like math problems. They have solutions. Okay? Some of them are hard ones. They're hard to work. I can't work them all. But... Some of them aren't as hard as others, so we work the easy ones, then we start working on the harder ones. So most of our problems are fixable. So if they are, then don't, don't get into those emotions over here like me and Glenn. <coughs> My favorite color is green. Oh, man. I don't want to be angry, and I'm mad about having green in there. <coughs> but I like blue, too. That's supposed to be peaceful like the ocean. Okay, anyway, I told you I'd get off base. All right, let's see. An amalgam tattoo. That is where in the process of a uh, filling being put in, a mercury filling, a little bit of it gets into the gums. The gums get kind of scuffed up or something, and the, the amalgam gets into the gums, and it's just it's literally a tattoo. That's the way a tattoo's made. They put ink, they prick it, ink gets in there, and it stays underneath the skin, so it colors it. Well, we can use a laser to go in there just to obliterate it. We have suction going so it gets the fumes out of there. But uh, it just obliterates it and then the gum grows back nice and pink and firm. That's the part. Can be removed and treated with a laser. Okay. Proper removal of mercury is important. First, we want to cover the airways. And that's, we use a rubber dam. That's just that little latex shield. And nothing sticks through but the tooth. So it keeps you from getting stuff down in your throat. Or at least it minimizes it. Nothing's perfect. But... You want to minimize it as much as possible. We also use a little oxygen hood uh, that's, uh, or cleanup. That's just a little uh, thing that has a high-powered suction that fits around the tooth. Sometimes you just can't get a rubber dam on. Some people choke or they have claustrophobia and they say, sorry, I just can't stand it. Yeah. I gag too much. So you say, okay. And you put the suction right next to it and just suck the pudding out of it. I mean, it's just, we use a real high-powered suction so it just gets the fumes out of there. Uh, in the office, we have... Uh, a lot of filtration going, different kinds of things, uh, high-speed evacuation. Chlorella is a, uh, anybody ever heard of chlorella? It's a bacteria, or rather a, an algae. And the, uh, the cell walls of the, of the algae are really what you have in your capsule. It's used industrially. They, uh, a played-out gold mine, okay, they'll uh, flood it with water and put chlorella in it and let the algae just proliferate. A few months later, they come in there and pump it all out. And then that algae dies and the cell walls of that algae have uh, bonded to the little bitty pieces and, of uh, uh, heavy metal that's left. Some of it's mercury, some of it's gold. A lot of times the metals kind of 
go together. So anyway, the uh, cell walls are what is in that chlorella. And, and we, we rinse that, we make a little paste and kind of rinse around the teeth with it. Yes, sir? I know you do that, but is that uh, standard training for biological dentists? Some. Everybody's got their own little routine. Okay. It used to not be mine until I thought, oh, we could do that. Instead of rinsing, tell them to rinse, stop in the middle of it and have them rinse, I think, I'm just going to paint it on there. I get a real thick paste and paint it on there and then rinse it out. The intent, again, is to minimize exposure. Oh, the other thing, we put an oxygen hood so we cover the other breathing hole. Make sure they get good fresh oxygen while we're doing this. Okay, if you're breastfeeding, uh, what we tell them is to pump prior to removal and then dump the next few days. For the first two, the, for two or three days before you come in, you pump the breast milk, uh, put it in the freezer, however you do it, and then after the procedure, pump it and just throw it away and feed them what's in the refrigerator. And you say, well, they have to eat half, oh, they own half ration? Well, mix it with something or feed them something else. Hey, they're going to live, I can tell you. Those rascals, they'll live. You know, there's one thing that the hospitals say that you're going to get my opinion now. There's nothing wrong with a young infant having a little bit of clean water. And so you can also go and get some pediatric apple juice, uh, mix that with half of pure water, and you can mix that. So you can use some other things that the child actually needs to help cleanse the system or help, help the bowels and everything. And they'll get their milk also. Thank you. Now I'm going to use that. See, that's what I do. I learn so many things from you, your patients, and then the next person that comes in, I'll tell them that, and they think I knew it. So, I, 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 yes, ma'am. Have you ever heard of dentists using chloral to when they're using the procedure? To do what? Using chloral. Clarks to what? When they're doing a certain procedure. After oh, yes. Now yes. Uh, Clorox is just bleach. Okay. Does it have anything to do with where the way they spell C H L O R? It's not. Oh no, that that was just a gene, the name of a gene. No, but uh, Clorox uh, wouldn't be good to drink it. But I can tell you this: you could rinse your mouth with straight bleach and spit it out, and then rinse with water, and I guarantee you're going to live. I've done it. Not just I just want to see. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm this way. <laughs> but it is a that if you want to uh, like there are certain cold disinfectants, okay, and glutaraldehyde and some things like that, and you put stuff in it. And one of the acid tests is how long does it take to kill hepatitis? How long does it take to kill polio? Uh, and I mean it'll kill HIV in a minute. But uh, that's that's one of the things is. How long does it take to truly sterilize something? And a lot of the stuff, you have to leave it in there 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes hours, six to eight hours, okay, depending on what it is you want to kill. You put something in bleach, in 10 minutes, it's gone. I mean, you can't even, if you can even see it. But it is dead, let me tell you. 10 minutes in bleach, it's dead, dead, absolutely dead and sterile. So is it a good sterilizer? The answer is yes. Now, if you're doing a root canal and you clean out that root canal, that's one place it is used a lot, is you put it in there and it bubbles out. And then when that's all, what you want to do is sterilize the canal. You don't want any bugs left in there. So after that, you rinse it and rinse it and rinse it. You sterilize. And in the uh, in industry, uh, civil engineering, uh, pollution, the, the old saying is the solution to pollution is dilution. In other words, you dilute it enough, it's not going to be a problem anymore. So, one of the reason I'm telling you this is, let's keep some perspective. One of the things that, this, the, that the research is showing in the dental field is, if you cut a preparation, remember that I cut out where the filling used to be, and this day I went ahead and finished and got everything out clean. Uh, what do you do to sterilize that? Well, one of the things we know that will do that is a little bleach. Put some Clorox in there for a few minutes, then rinse it back out. Then you know that thing is totally sterilized, or about as close as practically possible. Uh, the other way you can do that is use a laser to go over it. You can use other kind of disinfectants. There are different things on the market to do that. And we know that putting Clorox in there is going to do two things. One, 
it's going to make the uh, it's going to make it clean, and sometimes it'll even bond better if you're using a bonding material. But right now, this is what the latest research that I've read shows that it, it, they're not quite ready to say we should use this routinely. I know it's just a kind of a question off the cuff, but it was a good question. And what I want to do is keep directing us back to practicality. Now, here's a real idea. I've got cotton slacks on, leather shoes, leather belt, cotton shirt. I've got a wool jacket. Now, am I going to go straight to jail without pass and go? I don't know. Probably not. But socks, they're mostly cotton, but they got a little something synthetic in it. And it's going to be nearly impossible to not have something synthetic on. And I've seen Glenn. That boy, he dresses. He's got everything just right. Pants, shirt, silk, every, everything's right. But if he's going to wear socks, there's something in there. Okay. <clears throat> so what do you do? You do the best you can. But don't go ride another wheel just because you wore some socks that have something elastic in the edge. You know? Okay. So just always keep the practicality. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. How about hydrogen peroxide and, and working in your mouth? Uh, it can be a very good disinfectant. You're right. There's a book, The One Minute Cure, where you drink a little bit. That can be also real good. Totally different things. It's a good disinfectant. Don't know if it's uh, 3%. Don't use anything but about 3% in your mouth. Don't get higher than that. And ideally, kind of dilute that in half. The food grade's always a lot better. You but, food grade? Oh, yeah. Yeah, if the food grade, a lot of times, it's 35%. That stuff's caustic. Yeah. It'll eat up stuff. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a quick comment, just in case. You know, I don't mean to sound combative at all, but going touching on the idea of uh, water and feeding that to babies thing. I don't know like how current the information is, I guess, that you, Dr. King, have heard. But I've been told that giving babies too much water is actually not a good thing. And even my doctor has told me that too much water in babies is not good. And there have been cases where even women, like on welfare, will water down the formula because they can't afford formula and the babies have died from it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, too much too much water in humans is not good either. Big people. Yeah, you can get too much water. But you make a really good point, and it should go not just to babies, but to grown-ups. You can get too far on this water drinking stuff. If you too. Did, you can literally die yeah. too much water too Okay, other metals in teeth. Uh, this is a crown. It's a porcelain veneer crown. It has a metal... Uh, Coping, which is the part that actually fits the tooth. This is what I was talking about a while ago. Some of the hardeners can be copper and cadmium, which is not good. Nickel, which is not good. Beryllium, which is real bad. Non-pressured alloys. Uh, depends on what they are and, and how you rack to them. And gold, of course, the, usually the better, the higher the gold content, the better. Orthodontic wires and brackets have nickel and titanium in them. In fact, the nickel titanium ones are probably some of the best ones because they're designed so that you can get them cold and they're very, very flexible. And then as they warm up in the mouth, then they start bringing the teeth out. So they're very easy to put in that way. Now, should you not ever get braces because they're metal? Well, I'll go over this later, but the answer is get some braces. They're going to be in there for a couple of years. And you shore them up physically, mentally, emotionally, nutritionally. Uh, but it's better to have braces in there, in my opinion, for a couple of years than to go a whole lifetime with teeth that bang each other, they're crooked, they're growing the wrong way, they're hard to get clean because they're too crooked and they're crowded. Uh, it just sets up problems and it sets up structural problems if they don't fit right. Okay, partial denture framework. This is probably chromium cobalt, which is not good, but it's not real, real bad. It's highly polished. You don't get too much... Uh, you don't get transmission like you do from mercury, not at all. Uh, you can make them out of gold, too heavy usually, and you know a two thousand dollar partial might end up costing four thousand dollars just because of the gold. And then titanium, hard to cast. Usually you have to cast it once or twice, three times to get it right. But it's light and it's it's also pretty good. Yes, sir. The question is, is there an alternative for a layer of gold and cap? to hide discoloration of the tooth? Oh, the answer is yes. I'll get to that. But the answer is yes. Okay. Metal alternatives. Wasn't that a good...
segue. Thank you. Uh, crowns. The technology has been really good to us. We can make crowns that have a zirconium oxide base to it. Zirconium oxide is very hard. It's used industrially as a liner for kilns that you make ceramics in. Okay? Uh, so it can stand a lot of heat. Uh, and it's very, very strong. So it's good for somebody that's a tooth critter? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, uh, the main thing it's good for you is because it's inert. Uh, for the people that have taken chemistry classes, the dishes that we get, the, that you boil all your stuff in, uh, when you're doing your experiments, are made out of ceramic. Because you will not get an interaction if you did it with an aluminum dish. The aluminum in the dish would get into your mixture. But it's, it's pretty inert. So what you have is zirconium oxide uh, in the uh, inside and then regular ceramic around the outside. Uh, partial dentures, we can make them uh, out of all plastic uh, or a nylon-based plastic, uh, which some prefer. And it is uh, not as retentive or as stable as the metal ones. And it would be better if they were supported by teeth or with some implants. Now, some people say you should never have any implants. And I agree. But... What if you have missing teeth? Well, I've got a missing front tooth on my top. And I've got some spaces up there, so if I had a bridge, I'd have a big fat tooth in the middle, and I'd have to cross the midline. This tooth and then this tooth over here. I've got a very weak tooth trying to hold up, which would be one of two teeth holding up for three. So the best alternative for me would be to have an implant. I have one. and. I'd already lost my titanium virginity because I had a screw in my knee, so I thought, <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going with an implant. <laughs> and it, it's working. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Just, just in a aside, you talked about getting a homeopathic remedy um, to, because you have the titanium and you're just going to have to live with it. There's a thing called NAET. Yes. That yes. Also. Yes. There's other ways to desensitize from things. Whatever. Whatever it takes. There's. Uh, there's some EFT things. There's some. Uh, with uh, TKM, you could do. I guess the, uh, the. Where you put the substance on your chest and they do the meridian sequence, which helps neutralize the the effect of it on you. Good point. Thank you. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Excuse me. Don't listen to me give you any information about how to do stuff. I just throw out all the numbers I can think of. Yes, ma'am. Um, on the implants, mm -hmm. earlier when you were talking about extractions and all that, that can affect the acupuncture meridian and energy spheres. So is it literally the gap itself, or is it the idea that that original tooth is missing? It could like, be, it, yeah, it could be, yeah. Hand, it, that's, a, that's a good question. It could be because when, when the extraction was done, if, there was, if it was not a complete healing, that could be an, uh, an obstruction right in that extraction site. Or it could be... Uh, that what I was talking of really is if you'd had a tooth taken out maybe for orthodontic reasons and another tooth was moved into its place, then you'd have to look at the teeth on either side of that to see which ones correlate. Good question. And if an implant is put in there, another good question, then it could be the implant that could either be an effect, positive or negative, and there's other ways that could be neutralized. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, my son has a congenital uh, tooth, baby, mm -hmm. baby tooth, there's that one underneath. And so they're telling him that he would probably need the implant. They're going to wait till he's 18. He's only 14. But so there's nothing else to consider as far as space maintainer or anything else that would be no, less invasive. I just usually leave that tooth there as long as it'll go. It's falling kind of like. It's okay, if it's starting to come out. No, it's not. No, it's sink. It's oh, sink. oh, yeah. It gets ankylosed to the bone yeah. sometimes. But it's maintaining the thickness of that bone. If yes. you take it out, sometimes the bone will cave in. But as long as it's there, you're maintaining the thickness. Until it gets old enough to get an implant. Right. Correct. Because he'll, he'll keep growing. So I'd, I'd say get on the other side of 18 yeah. for a boy. Girls, sometimes 16. Okay, dental implants. Uh, titanium or zirconium. Uh, only about a year ago did zirconium get uh, FDA approval in the United States. I've been doing it in Brazil for years and Europe for years. It's always great because you, know, you try everything out and if it doesn't kill the Europeans, we can probably do it here. <laughs> it worked pretty well there. So uh, it's, now neither one of them are ideal. You know, ideal would be to have a perfect tooth in there, but sometimes we don't have that. Uh, so uh, it's, it's better than nothing. And it depends on the robustness of the body, the amount of density of the bone, the health history, 
whether to do it or not to do it. If somebody's in the middle of a bunch of uh, cancer treatments, they're uh, depleted in every respect, I wouldn't say put an implant in. I'd say get well, get strong, and then when you're ready, then we'll go in there and do it. If there's not enough bone, then you can go in there and augment the bone to get it to a little bit thicker or bigger and or wider so there's enough room to put the implant in and then do it. How do you but, augment that? By the bone graft? Uh, yes, yeah. Or you can go in there, cut a hole, split, sounds awful, split it so it wedges out and then put it in there and then it'll start healing in there. Yes, ma'am. I've had dentists uh, speak about putting some kind of, like once they extract the tooth, putting some kind of powder in there. Yes. To form, yeah. That will form them. Yes. There's different ways to do that. And some of it is uh, cadaver bone. That sounds awful. But what they do is they literally go th take everything out of it that's, that's um, I don't want to say organic. They take all the tissue out of there. So the, and it's, it's sterilized, it generally is sterilized. And then uh, you put that in there and it acts as a lattice work for the bone to grow around. Another stuff that I like that's, because it is synthetic is uh, it looks like real tiny, tiny little BBs. They go in the hole, you mix it with their own blood. When you extract the tooth, you suction a little blood out with the syringe and mix it with the, the uh, what is it, bio-wasp is what we call it. And then put it back. It's what the name is, Cerasorb. And then uh, put, it, put it in the socket. After we take out the tooth and clean it out real well, put it in the socket. And then what happens is the blood around it mixes with that synthetic stuff, and it acts as a lattice work. Like roses that grow up a trellis, the bone grows in and around it. And then once the bone is established, it just resorbs the synthetic part gets rid of it. So what's left is all bone. But it's dense, very hard, and it maintains that thickness. Because if you take a tooth out and you don't do that, it tends to cave in. Then you've got a narrow piece of bone to try to get an implant in. If you've got the thickness, you've got a, enough to take the core out and put the, the implant in so you have more, more bone to work with. So you do implants? Yes, ma'am. I do both. It just depends on the situation. Now, there's advantages and disadvantages of each one of these. This, uh, this one, you, the uh, zirconium implant, you have to put in in one piece. Now, that looks pretty simple right there because that's that picture. In real life, when you're way back on one of the back teeth, there's not room to get that whole thing back there and put it straight down. You can put it in at an angle or... You just have to get them to open that jaw. And some people just can't open up because they've got teeth down there and there's not enough room to get their instruments back there. So with this one, you actually put just the root part in there, cover it up, let it heal, and then later come and screw on a abutment on top of it, which is the part you put the crown on. So it's a two-stage thing. So on the very back, people can't open very wide. This is what I would do. Uh, it's just sometimes you just can't... You know, for one reason or other, you can't do the other. Yes, ma'am. If you have a choice, would you do the implant versus the uh, a bridge connecting to the two teeth? That's a good question. Long term, implant is probably better because they have a, they're, especially the titanium ones because they've been around longer. Got a great track record, 15, 20 years, and by then, you know, what's going to pull it out? I've got to tell you, I tried to take one out. It had been on a la in a lady probably for six months, seven, and she started getting an infection around it. She had a lot of other health problems, so I tried to take it out. I broke an instrument getting it out. And it was, it was having uh, infection problems around the top of it. It was a very long one, and only the bottom probably fifth of it at best. Maybe the bottom fourth of it was integrated. I couldn't get it out. And I was afraid it was going to break her bone. So I, I referred her to an oral surgeon. And uh, because if it was going to break, I wanted it to happen in his office where he could fix it. And, but she never did go in. She ended up dying of liver cancer. Uh, but that's one thing. She kept putting things off and putting things off. Ideally, would have done that implant a decade ago. But, just, that's, but the point of it all is it integrated so hard that I couldn't get it out. The only way you can get it out, really, is to drill all the way around it, and that would have made that bone very, very weak on her. So, uh, uh, 
they, the, the point is that it can integrate so well that uh, it's, it's hard for them to fail unless you just totally abuse them. Uh, a bridge, you have two teeth holding up for three. So it's harder on each one of these. And it depends on where it is. Uh, this tooth, the third one from the front, is one of the very strongest teeth in your head. When you, uh, it's a canine. Um, yeah. When you, uh, if you ever see somebody that has one tooth or two teeth, those are usually the ones. Either this one or the uh, Those suckers are strong. Now, if that tooth is missing, you have to bridge between this bicuspid and this lateral, which is the second tooth. That second tooth is one of the weakest teeth in your head. So I wouldn't want to have to hold on to that because this baby's made to take a lot of force up and down and sideways. And it would really stress out this other tooth up here. So we might end up losing it for bridging it. So that, on that tooth, that'd be a great one to put a big implant in. Easy to get to, easy to get one of these kinds of implant in. Well, not easy, but a lot easier than the back. Okay. I keep going. Oh, look at that. This makes you want to look at that, doesn't it? Okay. The thing to remember, nothing is perfect and nothing is permanent. So even the, all of us dentists with the best of our intentions, what we do is not perfect. And what I'm telling you today is not perfect. If you heard me again a month from now, I might be able to tell you something better. I hope I just keep trying. That's, again, like I say, that's why I call it a practice. I'm just trying to get better every day. Okay, orthodontics. I'll go back to that one again. Traditional metal brands, brackets and wires, and then plastic aligners. There's advantages and disadvantages of both. You've heard of Invisalign. There's different, a couple other companies that uh, make the plastic aligners. Now, a comparison. Traditional orthodontics have wires and brackets. The clear orthodontics use clear plastic aligners. There's a broad range of orthodontic therapy that uh, the orthodontics will do. And uh, this is, of course, a, an advertisement. Part it came from an advertisement to do these. But it says it's most suitable for patients with limited needs. And if you don't have far to go, if you don't have a really hard case, it's usually going to work pretty well. I've done some on some very, very hard cases. And they didn't work very well. But it was better than nothing because a couple of these young men that I did this on, if we hadn't used the, in, the Invisalign, they wouldn't have had it done. They would not have had it done. And they were a lot better when we finished than when we started. But as you might imagine, a lot of us dentists are OCD, HDAD, whatever it is. Uh, because, you know, we want everything to be perfect. And with, uh, with a filling, it's like I can usually win that one. You know, you get the decay out, put a filling in. It's like I won that one. With braces, you can't always make a move right where you want to. And sometimes when you get through, you turn your back and they relapse. You know, and it's crazy. Some people take their braces off, never wear a retainer, and it never moves a bit. Other people, by the next morning, it's like halfway back to where it came from. The retainer will hardly go back on. So in the orthodontics, usually we're thinking permanent retention. Wear these retainers for the rest of your life. But, so, but if those are metal, you don't necessarily... That's right. That's right. There are differences. Now, some people have them bonded on there. I've seen them bonded on the front two teeth to keep them spread apart again. Uh, I, wouldn't, I would avoid that if I could. And can I? Yes. You can make a clear plastic aligner like the one I was showing you a while ago uh, and use it for a retainer. And they wear out and you have to get another one made. But you still don't have something stuck in there that's permanent and that's, that's metal. Yes, ma'am. Um, would you recommend then, uh, my, my daughter-in-law had that when she was a kid, she had braces and her parents had the permanent retainer behind her front teeth. Mm -hmm. And now one of her front teeth is literally dying from resorption. They call it the, where the gum is actually growing down inside the tooth. And she's looking at having to have an uh, implant or something done like that about that now and she still has that wire there and the first thing I said when I realized that that was it is that you've got to get that wire out of there that's what the problem is and um, she you know she, so now she's got to get that removed and do something with the tooth after that though would you recommend her getting a, a, a plastic retainer made? Uh, yes something but like she's that. ultimately she's still going to have to have that tooth extracted because it's going to deteriorate Just, you know. but then after that will be the retention Okay, I'll quit loitering here. Uh, anyway, 
Okay, suitable. Uh, the, the, if I had a complicated case, a difficult case, uh, the, the wires or brackets are the best way to go. Uh, when it gets real close, if you say, I want these off, you might finish up with, with the uh, aligners. But you can't get as much control with the aligners as you can with a bracket as far as tiny specific movements. Okay, uh, elect uh, electromagnetic fields. The um, galvanic response that can help set up electromagnetic fields. You can also, uh, uh, Dr. King will probably talk about this and some other things. You, uh, electromagnetic fields can affect different parts of your body and your teeth can be subject to that and they can actually make that worse. Uh, metal in your mouth can, getting it out can make it a little bit better. Okay, root canals, what are they? Essentially, it's a long glorified filling that goes all the way down into the nerves. It's all cleaned out, and then you put something inert in there. It doesn't really matter so much what you fill it with. What's important is what is it sealed with. And did you get it sterilized? Did you get it cleaned? Uh, what I would do, I don't do root canals. If I did one, what I would do is go in there with a laser and use that to help sterilize and then I would go in there with ozonated water, which would kill uh, air, everything. So, you know, not human bodies, but it would kill, kill the bacteria. Okay, uh, let's see what's next. First, the nerve tissue and pulp are removed from the tooth. This removes the source of the infection. And then the area is sterilized and then filled. And then the tooth requires a crown due to the fragility of the tooth. When a tooth has had a root canal, it's going to be a little more... Uh, uh, brittle and more likely to break. So you cover it so that it can't split or break. You don't always have to do a root canal when you do a crown though. You can do a crown without a root canal. But when you do a root canal, you can pretty much count on having to do a crown afterwards. Now, some are good, some are bad. There's some people that say every root canal in the world ought to be taken out. I am not in that camp. The reason is there are some people walking around that are very robust they're doing just fine, they have root canals. The other reason I've had uh, uh, physicians refer people to me and say, you've got to get this tooth out no matter what. This tooth is a big time problem. We don't have time to wait. You can't try anything. You just have to get it out. So we get that tooth out. And I look at the x-rays and there's three root canals on the other side, which didn't even show up in any of the tests as being anything bad. Why? I don't know. We don't always know the answer. We can conjecture. It might have been split, it might have been, uh, if it has a vertical crack, it's never going to get well. It's always going to have a place to have bacteria growing in there. So there's lots of things that could be a, a factors in this. But in my opinion, a very well done root canal is something that some of us can carry. Where I start getting to the camp that says we need to get it out is if you have autoimmune diseases, a history of malignancies, you're in the middle of cancer treatment, something like that, you fight for your life. You don't have time to piddle with stuff. Get out the question marks. And then, when they get well and good, then you start thinking in terms of what do you do to replace it permanently. Okay, cavitations. Everybody ever heard of that? This is like the, this, uh, it's, a, it's a cavity or a hole in the, or in the porous uh, chamber within the bone. It's also known as Nico lesions. They can be hollow, full of partially filled with old blood, fat, residues of socket dressings. This, like, they're just real variable. They're mostly, uh, mostly we uh, uh, find them in the orthopedics, find them in the hips, knees, long bones, but also the jaws. Cavitations are found by, and none of these is totally reliable on its own. Uh, there's a, uh, okay, history, x-rays, uh, Cone beam imaging, which is another x-ray, MRIs. A lot of times they will not show up on x-rays because you have to have 30 to 50% of the bone destroyed before it will show up on an x-ray. Unless it's real, real, real bad, it might not show up. So they're, they're difficult to diagnose. Okay, the cause again, unknown. That could be a variety of reasons. All the way from trauma to uh, infection. Uh, when a tooth was extracted, person might have been exposed to some kind of a virus or something. It found a weakness. It landed in that area. It uh, did not fully resolve, but it didn't get so bad that it made a fulminating infection. So it's just kind of a standoff. But it ends up being a uh, barrier to the uh, pathway or the acupuncture meridian, however you want to say that. 
Okay, cavitation, the second and third molar area. This is a cadaver. I dissected, I cut it right here. I made a split like this and then folded it open. And it doesn't show up real. It's just kind of brown right there. It just not look, doesn't look like good bone. This is relatively good bone. That is not. Okay, this is a, a section underneath a, an extracted tooth. Okay, right, it's an extracted, this is an extracted tooth that has a bridge. I cut a little section out and then turned it around like this. And you can see here, that's where the nerve goes through. And uh, it should just be a tunnel, just a little tunnel where you have the nerve and blood vessels going through it. This part is right underneath the part that was extracted. It's all foot of, full of mushy fat. It's okay to have fat in the bone marrow, but not that much. It should be good bone in there. So that's what one looks like. You can see just a little bit of a dark area right there. When a, when a patient is embalmed, when they die, the uh, embalming fluid goes through all the vessels and should soak into everything. It did not soak into that little dark area there, which means it's necrotic, it's dead, but it didn't get any blood flow to it. And that was the problem. So that's just a small cavitation right there. This is a real one. I just opened it up and doing surgery on it. And that is where I, all I did was open up the bone. You can see it's hollow. You can see just a little bit of blood down there pooling in there. But we'd rinse that with water. But it, uh, anyway, it's just a hole. Wasn't anything dead in there. Just nothing there. Totally nothing. They're all just different. And what do you do to treat them? You treat them with laser. You use homeopathic injections. Surgery where you open, cure it, irrigate it, disinfect it, and then fill it in with bone. Maybe, maybe not. Close it. That's the surgery part. Uh, ozone, you can either actually inject ozone or, or treat it later with ozonated water. Uh, treat it externally with ozonated olive oil, not, not inside the socket. Uh, neurotherapy, TKM, or a combination. I usually throw everything I can at it. The remedies. Remedies for mercury? Get the mercury out and detoxify. For metals, use non-metal restorations. For electromagnetic fields, metal removal, and environmental changes. Like you're sleeping right next to an alarm clock, change it out to a battery clock. Uh, don't sleep next to anything that's plugged in. If you have a lamp, scoot it over. Get one of those clap things that turns it off and on. Uh, remedies for root canals. Uh, gemstones are homeopathic, but root canal shows up bad, you extract the tooth. Uh, you can put some gemstones in there, which will kind of neutralize the frequency. Everything has a frequency about it. If uh, the frequency is bad for you, you can find another gemstone that has a frequency that's the opposite, so that they at least neutralize each other. It doesn't fix it. It just keeps it, it just neutralizes the barrier, so to speak. You can do that with implants. Uh, and then for cavitations, you can do surgery, neurotherapy, laser, uh, surgery, or ozone treatment. Actually, in inject ozone in there. Sometimes the ozone, that's gas, which will end up killing bacteria, and then it breaks down very quickly into oxygen. Ozone is O3. It's three. It's a triplet of oxygen. And uh, oxygen is, as we breathe, is O2 which is a couplet. So the triplets, get two triplets and they break down immediately into three doublets, okay, or twins, okay. So it, first it goes in there as an ozone molecule, kills bacteria, quickly breaks down, and it hyperoxygenates the tissues. Vestibular ocular integration. I knew you were wondering about this when the day started. Uh, this has to do with, uh, well, I'll just read it. It uh, uh, refers to the integration of the eyes, ears, and the motor response to where one is in space. It requires the simultaneous coordination of three cranial nerves, which are three, four, and six. The other ones that operate the eyes. And then cranial nerve eight, which is for the semicircular canals in the middle ear. What does that have to do with me? As I do a lot of work with TMJ, the, TM, the jaw joint is right next to the middle ear. So there's a correlation with vertigo or or a uh, loss of uh, uh, sense of where you are in space. Uh, it's affected by, among other things, the occlusion, which is the, the bite, the way the teeth fit together, head posture, body structure mechanics, and the health of the ears, eyes, and cranial nerves. Vertigo happens when there's a disconnection between what's being seen and what is otherwise sensed with the body. About 80% of our sensory input regarding our position comes through our eyes. That leaves the other 20% to be divided between 
what affects our ears and balance, and what is sensed through our joints, muscles, and connective tissue. If you think about it, when I'm standing here, if I close my eyes, how do I know where I am? It's because I can sense what's coming through me through gravity, through my joints, and my muscles. Okay? Now, what if there's a disconnection? And that's only 20% of it. If I close my eyes, I'm knocking off 80% of what I usually use. So, one good test. You know, the sobriety test, when they say, close your eyes and stand on one foot. It's hard to do that when you're not drunk. That's right. <laughs> okay? Try it. Okay, yes. And that lets you know how much you're dependent on your eyes. And if you're nervous, I'm oh. <laughs> Okay. Now, weight distribution affects... Now, this is my perspective as a dentist now. What does it have to do with the rest of your body? Your weight distribution affects the proprioceptive input to the brain regarding our orientation. Proprioception. That's how you know where you are. If I close my eyes, how do I know my arm is up or down? How do I know? I can't see it. And, this, uh, you know, I'm feeling it with my jacket, but what if I didn't have a shirt on? I could still tell. How? Because of the difference in tension in the different ligaments and muscles. There are little receptors called proprioceptors. They stretch and move. So they give me an idea. It goes to my brain and tells me there's less stretching here, more stretching down here. So it must be up. So it does all those calculations. Now, if I, if you put two scales end to end, head to head, and stand on them both, have somebody look straight ahead, somebody read the scales, they're going to weigh differently. If I weigh 150 pounds, I'm not going to have 75 on one and 75 on the other. There's going to be a discrepancy. Now, if I put a cotton roll in one side of my mouth, it changes. Usually, if you put it in the heavy side, it'll start balancing out. Okay. If point is, your bite can affect your weight distribution, and your weight distribution can affect your bite. Uh, and vice versa. Now, piezoelectric stu uh, effects. I promise it won't go on forever. Uh, collagen, well, let's see, let's read that. Certain substances, if deformed, will emit a current of electricity. The collagen in your connective tissue is like that. Okay. Conversely, an electric current applied to this material will cause a deformation or take a distorted shape back to its original. In uh, industry, an example is an airbag activation in automobiles. How does that airbag know to deploy? With the concussion of a crash, a piezoelectric uh, device sends a current that releases the uh, bag. Now, that is why some of your TKM stuff works, is because when you touch something, you affect it electrically. So your, your connective tissue can, can pass a current. Remember like my example, if everybody went edge to edge, stiff arms, bumps my arm, his arm, and so forth, we could send an impulse from that wall to that wall this fast. Where, where if I tried to run that fast, it would be much slower. So through the fascia, you can get very, very fast electrical uh, transmission. So when you do TKM, you're touching someone, it affects it. It affects movement, it affects change in the tissues. Uh, collagen has a piezoelectric properties. Collagen is the primary constituent of fascia and connective tissue. That's what it looks like. It can be tough. How can TKM affect some of the things it does? It just seems like it's amazing. Why? Well, if the, uh, the consequence is polarizing or depolarizing the cells, Okay, because of the electrical impulse, can cause a change of permeability in the cell walls. So either things can come in or out of them faster or better, or something that's been locked in there can get out, so it can cause drainage, or it can cause a better, a better uptake of the nutrients you want. So that's one reason that, uh, one rationale why TKM can work. It can affect the uh, release of hormones, neurotransmitters, nutrients, waste products, and histamines and vasodilators across the cell walls. The current that runs along the connective tissues can ultimately cause neural stimulation by changing the transmembrane potential, I know you know that one, of a nerve with central nervous system and autonomic nervous system effects. Autonomic nervous system is the one that does it automatically. That's why you can do something that like TKM and it can affect your digestion. Okay. So there's a rationale for why some of this stuff can work. What is AMS? Automatic, autonomic nervous system. 
as a, which is sympathetics and parasympathetics, as opposed to the central nervous system, which is motor movements, yeah. sensing hot and cold, and things like that. What is the, the muscular thing? Like this, the oh, it's through the, uh, the uh, central nervous system, but TCAM can affect that also, because it's all connected with the uh, connective tissue. Where most of cancer is concerned are the lung, breast, abdominal areas. And these are statistics. Okay. The bladder actually is part of the abdominal ones. Breast, okay. Lung is the most. 219,000. This is in 2009. 192 breast, 146 colorectal. Okay. And this is just the females. Men, of course, 192 with prostate. But this one, breast, and then the rest of these, except for the lung, are all in the abdominal areas. So these are the areas that need prevention, they need uh, treatment. It's so much nicer to treat something before it happens, before it gets out of hand. And these are some of the things you guys can address a lot easier before anything happens than trying to do heroics after it has. Okay, treat these bad things after they happen or do circulation, stimulation, movement, drainage, immune system before they happen. Do you have any burning questions? These two muscles don't work anymore. I can't shoot. What is that related more to body, teeth, a couple of amalgams I still have? Where, where, what do you do? Where do you go? What do you... Well, that's uh, probably a combination of uh, uh, facial nerve and or trigeminal nerve, which are cranial nerves. So I don't know whether the motor part of that is just not working, uh, but if they once worked, I don't know why they can't work again. Uh, and I, so I, there's a lot of variables that can go with that. One is find out what happened when they stopped working and to see if you can help reverse it, give us some clues to where to go to deal with that. Yes, ma'am? ramifications of teeth hitting each other. Okay, if the bite does not fit, the teeth will end up banging each other instead of fitting. And as a result, it's just trauma. And it, the constant trauma of that ultimately goes up the nerve and the tooth says, I can't stand this anymore. Uh, and it can end up being a barrier to the pathways, the acupuncture meridians. It can also make the tooth start aching up to the point that it just dies. Uh, doesn't always happen, but usually it starts. It, it's, it's like somebody hitting on you just a little bit and it doesn't bother you at first. After a while, it irritates you. After a long time, it just drives you crazy. So it, ultimately, a tooth will start hurting enough to get your attention. So you've got to do something about that. How critical is it and how, how long does it take to you know, balance with that? As far as that's, that's either, you know, I had a dentist drill my good tooth instead of the crown. Oh. Uh, okay, she said a dentist wants ground off part of a good tooth instead of a crown. Sometimes when a tooth has been going down or breaking, then the other tooth below it grows up into that space. It doesn't grow like a weed, it just erupts a little more. And we're talking about fractions of a millimeter, not much. Sometimes it's better to take the lower one off. If there's plenty of tooth structure there, and you've already taken away quite a bit of tooth structure on the cr tooth you made a crown on. so. Uh, and it depends on what the crown's made of. If you have much, if you have plenty of crown left, you take it off. But the idea is to get it balanced. It just depends on which way is interfering. Is it that bottom tooth that's interfering, or is it the crown? A lot of times the crowns come back made ideal. If the lower tooth is the one that's natural tooth, but it's not ideal, actually probably better to recontour the lower one, as long as you're, you know within limits. Yes, ma'am. I've had. <clears throat> Sorry, I've had a tooth extraction, and it's like second to last molar on my left because I had an abscess and a lot of. Oh. Would you recommend just leaving a hole? Because that's what I've got right now. I've got a hole. Uh, or having an implant, or what? I guess. Yeah, ideally, probably an implant. Mm -hmm. Next, next, probably a bridge. You could always leave it there, uh, but in the long term, the teeth will drift. And then the tooth above the hole kind of comes down. And then you start getting more of the traumatic bite where it doesn't fit right or it, or it interferes when you go left and right. And I'll quit. Thank you.